Good morning again, everyone. Nice to see so many of you out here this morning to support our animals. I'm Lisa Steves from Up 93.1, and I'm so glad to be here. I, too, have animals and do not support the 24-7 tethering law. Uh, we want to get underway. We have a number of guest speakers to hear from this morning. And first off, I'd like to uh, introduce Rita Burr, please. Hi, animal lovers and advocates. To see this crowd, it's overwhelming. Seeing you walking out here with all your dogs, I had goosebumps. I had tears in my eyes. It's really overwhelming. Thank you for coming all out. We are here today to speak out, to speak out for the animals in our province and to address to the government that the public wants to see stronger and enforceable animal welfare laws to empower the New Brunswick SPCA. <laughs> to empower the SP, New Brunswick SPCA to effectively do their job in protecting the companion animals in our province and to prohibit 24 seven tethering of the dogs. <laughs> These animals cannot and should not have to go through another winter season suffering or dying with no protection by law and no punishment for the abusers. There can be no excuse for abuse. So Lisa will now take over and introduce all the speakers. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Rita. First up, I'd like to introduce Mayor Brad Woodside. He is the mayor of Fredericton. He returned as mayor in 2004, and on May 14, 2012, he was re-elected for a record eighth term. He is our longest serving mayor. It's Brad Woodside. Thank you very much, Lisa. Merci. Ça me fait plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui. It's my pleasure uh, to be here today uh, for one reason and one reason only. I'm a pet owner myself. And uh, it, uh, it says it all. It's very plain. Doesn't take a whole lot of words. Stop animal abuse and speak out. So that's why I'm here today to support this cause. I think it's a wonderful idea to have all the politicians here, to have them make the decision before the election. And uh, like the sign down there says, maybe they could learn if we tethered them for a while. Thank you very much, Ms. Z. Next up, we have Moncton East MLA Chris Collins. He is known for his passion for animals. He's always been there when uh, animals needed him to speak on their behalf. And through Mr. Collins' initiative, a new pet establishment regulation to the Act came into effect in 2012. So we'd like to thank Chris Collins for being here for the animals. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Ça me fait un gros plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui. I have some special guests here today as well that I'd like to uh, 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 recognize. First of all, Ryan Murphy, the former mayor of Mon Moncton and former member of parliament for Moncton, as well as Rick Doucette, the MLA for the uh, Charlotte Liz uh, the Isles, uh, which is down in St. George area, Hidal Dalbert, and uh, he's from Karakut, and there's, uh, there's uh, several other uh, 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 liberal MLAs here as well uh, today to support the, the animals. Uh, I mentioned my dog Guinness uh, today, and Guinness is a great animal, but his mother was uh, pretty spectacular. I want to talk to, talk to you about her for a, just a few moments. Uh, we, we went on a ski trip one time, and uh, Emily was uh, kenneled, and uh, was kenneled uh, just outside the city of Moncton, where they're building the new Moncton High School. And uh, uh, Emily escaped from the kennel, because we were away and she missed us. She escaped from the kennel, and over three days, she covered 20 kilometers, and found herself three days later 100 yards from our home. Because that... that we talk about how much we love our animals, but we also have to talk about how much our animals love us. And that is why we need stricter regulations. When I was in government, when I was the, uh, the uh, minister of local government, we passed some strict late regulations. But these regulations have to be worked on constantly because our animals love us, we love them, we need to work 
on these and continue to make them. And it's not the SPCA that should be making the laws. They should be enforcing the laws. Pet owners uh, and uh, the SPCA, along with other stakeholders, should be creating the laws. And they should be enforced by the SPCA. Uh, so I'm here today to say, to be very clear, that is, this government does not fix the regulations and make stricter regulations with regards to tethering than we will in September. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Our next speaker is Mr. Brill Grimmer of Shediac. He's the founder and uh, CEO of Grimmer's Canine College. He's an internationally respected and accomplished dog trainer for all aspects of dog work. Mr. Grimmer is the recipient of the prestigious YMCA Peace Medal in 1989. His curriculum vitae is three pages long, so I can't talk about him anymore because I'd be here all day. So I want to thank Mr. Grimmer for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice, eh? So, thank you animal lovers that are here today and those that couldn't make it that are still supporting us and supporting the cause. Better laws to protect animals. That's why we're here today. And why is that even necessary? It's necessary because some people lack compassion or they lack the education to understand what is right and what is just. So those of us who want to make those changes must force those with no compassion and we must educate those who don't know how to comply with what we strive for. Animal protection. Owning a pet, owning a dog, is a responsibility. And although changes have been made in roads, so to speak, to better an animal's life, we must work to increase the fairness to other species who share this world with us. Modern and present day science has proven beyond a doubt that animals are not mindless objects. Rather, they are thinking, loving, learning, and helpful cohabitants of our world. We who are here today and those who still support us and cannot be here today are here to demand changes and to show our government and our elected representatives that this is the right and the just and the popular thing to do. Today we are fortunate to have other experts here to stress their very important points of view that direct fairness to our dogs, our cats, and all our non-human species. I am here to talk about the archaic, the outdated, and the cruel practice of unattended tethering. Part of the education, and you have to take this back and tell people about this, is being able to stand up and explain it. Tethering refers to the practice of fastening a dog to a stationary object or stake, usually in the owner's backyard, as a means of keeping the animal under control. Definition. Unattended means leaving the animal alone, without supervision, and these terms do not refer to the periods when an animal is walked on a leash. Understand the practice of unattended tethering is both inhumane and it is also a threat to the safety of the confined dog, to other animals, and to humans. A threat to their safety. Okay, I said it was inhumane, but why is it inhumane? Dogs are naturally social beings who thrive on interaction with human beings and other animals. A dog kept tethered in one spot for hours, for days, for months, or even years suffers an immense, an immense psychological damage. 
An otherwise friendly and docile dog, when kept continually tethered, becomes neurotic, unhappy, anxious, and often aggressive. We don't, we are not allowed to lock children into a closet. In many cases, the necks of tethered dogs become raw, covered with sores, and I'm sure you've seen it. The results of improperly fitting collars, the dogs constantly yanking and straining to escape confinement. Dogs have even been found with the collars completely covered and embedded in their necks, the results of years of neglect at the end of a chain. This is a fact. So who says that dogs tethering a dog is in inhumane? Well, we do, and many other people do. The United States Humane Society does, and numerous animal experts. Matter of fact, the U.S. Department of Agriculture issued a statement in 1996 against tethering. The government issued a statement against tethering. They quote, our experience in enforcing the Animal Welfare Act has led us to conclude that continuous confinement of dogs by a tether is inhumane. A tether significantly restricts a dog's movement. A tether can also become tangled around or hooked on the dog's shelter structure or other objects and further restricting the dog's movement and potentially causing injury. That was in 1996. Where are we? But how does tethering pose a threat to humans? Well, I think if the New Brunswick SPCA is advocating, supporting, and even recommending unattended tethered, tethering for any time limits, they are in fact now condoning the conditioning of dogs to become aggressive and dangerous. Fact. Dogs tethered for long periods can become highly aggressive. Dogs feel naturally protective of their own territory. It is a fact of the dog. When confronted with a perceived threat, they respond according to their fight or flight instinct. A tethered dog unable to take flight often feels forced to fight, attacking any unfamiliar animal or person who unwittingly wanders into his or her territory. Numerous attacks on people by tethered dogs have been documented. Tragically, the victims of such attacks are often children who are unaware of the tethered dog's presence until it's too late. Furthermore, a tethered dog that finally does get loose after months and years of being tethered from its chains or tether may remain aggressive and is likely to chase and attack unsuspecting passerbys and pets. <coughs> Excuse me. Dog bites in Canada are a serious concern. Dog bites are very painful. Yeah. <clears throat> medically serious and at times even lethal. Canada averages hundreds and hundreds of dog bites a year and one to two deaths a year are attributed to dog attacks. In many cases, unsocialized animals are the culprit and the blame for that lies in the owner's negligence by design or pure ignorance. Adults and children walking by and experiencing such a medieval practice would be outraged at its continuance, both for the concern of the animal and for the safety of themselves. Such unattended animals live in conditions of filth from their own fecal matter and expose the public to airborne disease and to health concerns. Next one, so why is tethering dangerous to the dog? In addition to the psychological damage wrought by continuous chaining and tethering, dogs forced to live on a tether make easy targets for other animals, humans, and biting insects. A tethered animal suffers harassment and teasing from insensitive humans. Stinging bites from insects and in worse cases, attacks by other animals. Tethered dogs are also easy targets for thieves looking to steal animals for sale or reward and, to, and also for research institutions where to be used as training fodder for organized dog fights. Finally, dogs tethered can become entangled with other objects which can choke and strangle the dog to death. In my area alone, I've seen maybe two dogs that have been found hanging over their porch because they were unattended tethered and dead. Well, are tethered dogs otherwise treated well? 
Rarely does a tethered or tethered dog receive its sufficient care. Tethered dogs suffer from sporadic feedings, overturned water bowls, inadequate veterinary care. We've already heard that in the news in the past month. And extreme temperatures. During snowstorms, these dogs have no access to shelter or the shelter is insufficient. During periods of extreme heat, they may not receive adequate water or protection from the sun. What's more, because of their often neurotic, neurotic behavior, it makes them difficult to approach. Tethered dogs are rarely even given minimal affection. Tethered dogs may become part of the scenery and easily ignored by the owners. So thank you for your time and for caring for animals. There can be no compromise on unattended tethering. It must be prohibited and it must be enforced and it will not happen until we make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next we have uh, MLA Pam Lynch for Fredericton Fort Nashwalk. Uh, Mrs. Lynch is going to speak for the Honourable Danny Soucy, our Minister of Environment and Local Government. Good morning everyone. My name is Pam Lynch and I'm the MLA for Fredericton Fort Nashwalk. And I have some colleagues here who I'd like to introduce. And we have Minister Jody Carr, Minister Troy Lifford, MLA Jack Carr, and MLA Kirk McDonald. <laughs> Protecting animals from harm and neglect is everyone's concern, including our government. We all know how important our pets are to us. Look at how many of you have come out today to show your support. I'm a pet owner and an animal lover as well. We are committed to animal protection, and in fact, it was a member of our government who pushed for stronger legislation a few years ago, and that was Jody Carr, and I'd like to thank Jody for that. But there is always room for improvement. That's why we're in the process of reviewing our animal protection laws. One of the main issues that has come up is 24-hour tethering. I think we can all agree that 24-hour tethering of a dog is simply not acceptable. As a dog owner and an animal lover, I can tell you that it's not acceptable to me and it's not acceptable to this government. So today, I'm very pleased to tell you that our government will bring measures forward by this fall to address the issue of 24-hour tethering. We're also reviewing other aspects of animal protection laws and making sure that animals receive appropriate care. I want you to know that we're also in the process of developing a standards of care document. We have heard strong and passionate responses from all of you and from several individuals and groups. It's clear that you take animal protection very seriously, and we all do. As I mentioned, government has been working with a number of stakeholders over the past several months, including people for stronger animal protection, advocating for animals, Animalia Canada, the NBSPCA, and others. They are giving us valuable input, and we've listened, and will continue to welcome input from New Brunswickers on this issue. Our care and treatment of our animals is an ongoing issue, and our end goal is strong and enforceable animal protection laws. So once again, on behalf of our government, I thank you for your passion and commitment to animals. Merci. Thank you, Pam. Up next, uh, you have met her already this morning, Rita Burr. She's from Moncton. She's a member of PFSAP, the, of course, People for Stronger Animal Protection and Stop Animal Cruelty in New Brunswick. And, of course, she's a very, very passionate animal rights advocate. Yes. Now, it's a little bit of dry speech because it's about the law. But please, I'm not a speaker. I'm just an animal welfare advocate. Stay with me, and uh, I appreciate your patience. Now, PSA would like to inform you that recently we have received several comments asking, and I think we have one, one lady here just walking around with a sign for pigs or for farm animals. However, however, if 
so they were asking us if we only work towards stronger laws for cats and dogs and not for all animals or farm animals. For some circumstances, as Pam already mentioned, in some cases laws are already in place. Some may need more explanation with regards to the interpretation of the legislation which already exists. PSAP does care for all animals, but we have to start somewhere. And do not forget, please, PSAP is not an organization. PSAP is just a grassroots group of concerned private citizens who took it upon themselves for, to fight for the well-being of the companion animals. PSAP is one of the stakeholders in the discussions with the government. These advocates came together after the disturbing copper case became public in February of 2013. The German Shepherd dog tethered for 14 years in what many citizens along with PSAP felt was an environment deprived of human contact with improper shelter, his body full of arthritis and other health issues, which most definitely affected his well-being. So many other coppers have to live under similar or even worse circumstances, suffering day and night in isolation and vulnerable to all influences as weather, insect, cold temperatures, vulnerable to other dogs as Bill Grimm already mentioned, wild animals, and some unfortunately at the hand of unsympathetic humans. Sadly, not everyone is open to feeling compassion for animals. And in many cases, there is no common sense to be expected. Education is given, but in most cases of neglect, abuse, and cruelty, Education will not find an open ear. Therefore, we have to pass laws that prevent and stop inhumane behavior towards animals and laws which will absolutely be enforceable. This is why we all came together to speak out, to put awareness out that to all animal lovers in the province that we have to remind the government that our animal welfare laws need to be amended now. And not, and not out of inconvenience being pushed into the next year or not changed at all. The vast majority of New Brunswickers are pet owners and 8,000 people have signed our petitions asking for change. At the end of each leash is a voter for the next election. PSAP, together with other two other stakeholders groups, have worked diligently for the last 13 months on defining regulations to give the dogs the protection they deserve and have forwarded the same to the Department of Environment and Local Government. Some of the recommendations PSAP is aiming for are, and hopefully, will be anchored in the new code of practice in the care for dogs, such as the required standards for outdoor dogs and the safety for outdoor dogs. We want to see accepted with these uh, freezing winter seasons in Canada, first, regulations for temperatures and weather conditions. A dog has to be taken inside into the home or a warmer area. Next, regulations of how a shelter must be built, large enough for the animal to stand up and to stretch out, but still small enough to be able to keep its body temperature. So don't put it in a baby barn, it will not be able to keep the body temperature. Regulations to unfrozen water, to water, food and medical attention. Then regulations that shade has to be provided at all times for the dog on a tether or in a pen. Then very detailed regulations on tethering a dog in a way to not endanger its health, safety, or well-being. And the time restriction on the tethering. There shall be no 
24-7 tethering of a dog anymore. And no tethering at night. There are also regulations to the minimum size of a pen or kennel, and they shall not be used as a permanent confinement for the dog. The dog must be provided with daily access to exercise and interaction with people or other dogs, or even both. These are only a few points of so many changes PSAP has been asking for to be included and amended to the law. 24-7 tethering must become history. You may ask, what about all other changes to the Act, which need to be dealt with also? It was recommended to all stakeholders to concentrate on changing the standard of animal care first, as these are falling under the regulations with the Act and can more easily and quickly be amended. Changes to the Act itself have to be approached and dealt with after the election with the party in power. Now, there are so many cat lovers here, we, I just want to touch the base, uh, bases with the cats. This is a very touching and very difficult subject for cats and kittens. We probably have many cat lovers and advocates within our group today, and this is why I will mention some important points you all should know of. From the beginning, PSAP has implemented the cats in their standards of care, just the same as we did with the dogs. PSAP has been asked by the New Brunswick SPCA to write a code of practice for the care of cats. PSAP has done so and has forwarded the same to all stakeholders, the government, in hopes of consideration. PSAP has done the first baby step to finally include cats and kittens to strengthen their protection within our laws. By the way, all recommendations are open for discussion. It is up to the government to decide what kind of changes they want to accept, create a draft, and eventually implement within the law. Now, referring to PSAP's code of practice for the care of cats, New Brunswick SPCA, another stakeholder, has clearly stated, quote, the proposed requirements, our requirements, that all cats in New Brunswick must be spayed or neutered, except pedigree show cats, those owned by or traded between licensed breeders, is a well-intended measure to deal with cat overpopulation. Low-cost spay neuter facilities are to be encouraged in every way, as are regula regulatory and financial incentives to spay and neuter. But in our view, this is New Brunswick SPCA saying, but in our view, the blanket legal requirement called for in the proposed code goes beyond what the province of New Brunswick can reasonably impose upon the citizens and the requirement would be beyond the power of the New Brunswick SPCA even to begin to enforce. New Brunswick SPCA is furthering mentioning, quote, the current movement of reform New Brunswick's animals protection law began with the concern for the special need of dogs, given their special vulnerability as animals normally be kept tethered or penned to a great concern with the need of cats at this time. However, and pressing those needs has the potential to sidetrack the delay and reform in this and other areas, especially when it is unclear just what can and should be done for cats through regulatory change. As a strategic measure, the New Brunswick SPCA thinks that the province should forego 
the attempt to introduce new regulation specific to cards at this time. Now, PSAB, in their mission to protect animals in our province, has done their very best in making the first step in putting awareness out that cats and kittens must also be protected by law. PSAB is now calling on all cat rescue groups to get together even if to take our code of practice for the code of cats as an inspiration and framework to you to do your own research of what you need to change or to be included in the code to regulate the problem of the cat overpopulation so a kill 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 solution can be history in the near future Only, only these groups together can fight and stop the abuse and neglect these animals have to endure in our province. Cut rescue groups, get together, speak out loud and clear for a humane solution for this problem. <laughs> Saab and other advocacy groups were driven by the desire to help continuously tethered dogs. We understand the New Brunswick SPCA Act and regulations must be enforceable by closing the existing loopholes and thoroughly defining the existing paragraphs of standard for animal care. And this will indeed be possible. A new code of practice for care for dogs in New Brunswick has been proposed. And this is exactly what PSAB and other stakeholder groups have been working on. Our recommendations have been sent into the Department of Environment and Local Government to their choice and decision of revision, which they find practical and enforceable and being of importance to be amended to the law. Stakeholders will continue to play a role as government creates their draft document. We will continue to advocate for the animals. We are all speaking out together as advocates and the public have the power. We, all advocates and the public have the power and we are asking the government to not hold back any outcome which may question life or death to the many companion animals. We cannot and should not allow animals to endure a life of abuse, neglect, abandonment, or be subjected to another harsh winter season without the appropriate protection under the law. We must also remind the government and the New Brunswick SPCA that our new regulations to the law must be for the animals and not to accommodate the public or to make it easy for this organization. It is of great concern to PSAP if New Brunswick's SPCA's tethering recommendations, as we are aware of, will be accepted that we have not helped these 24-7 tether dogs as it will not be enforceable and will still give the irresponsible owners the chance to have their dogs tethered 24-7. We sincerely hope the government will decide to take all the advocacy groups, recommendations and concerns into consideration and will decide on what we and the public is standing for. We all hope after this process is complete, we will have one of the best regulations for the protection of our companion animals in Canada. New Brunswick will have sent a strong message about who we are and what we are standing for. Thank you all for listening and for being here. Thank you, Rita.
Uh, dog trainer and singer songwriter Kim Nolan from Nova Scotia is here today. And uh, she has gladly offered to allow Peepsap to debut a song that she co wrote with Nick Potapaw, sang and published. And she created a video about chained dogs. Now, this song is being heard publicly for the first time here today. We're thrilled that she's given us the opportunity to listen to her beautiful voice and the words portrayed through the eyes and the soul of a dog. We want to thank Kim for her creation, and the proceeds are going to rescues, and that is very amazing. She's brought some CDs with her today, should you be interested. You can see her after the rally, and she's going to donate half of the proceeds to New Brunswick Rescues and half to Nova Scotia Rescues. So we are honored and very proud to present Dog's Cry at our silent minutes. Thank you, Kim. Glad to see I'm not the only one wiping my eyes uh, this morning or this afternoon now. Um, next, uh, unfortunately for uh, health reasons, Dr. Mildred Drost can't be here. Uh, she is a veterinarian in the Florenceville uh, Vet Clinic, and she's also the founder of Dunrome and Stray and Rescue, which uh, most of us are very familiar with. Up next, we have Scott Saunders. He's uh, one of a kind, and he's very passionate about everything he does. Scott's been an inspiration to other animal advocacy groups and has helped tremendously with his knowledge and experience through his own quest of improving legislation in Nova Scotia. He continues to motivate people to stand up and speak out against animal abuse. We're very excited to have him with us today. Scott Saunders from People for Dogs, Nova Scotia. It is so wonderful to see so many caring and compassionate people here today. Your voice and your commitment will generate a lifetime of change for suffering animals in this province. In the future, they will live better lives because of you. You are part of a huge movement that is happening here in the Maritimes as well as across the country. Tomorrow in Alberta, there is a rally asking for federal changes to protect animals. Together, people are taking a stand. All of us want the best laws in Canada to protect not only companion animals, but all animals. You are making this happen by showing up here today. People for Dogs is a Nova Scotia Nova Scotian grassroots organization founded by three people who refused to accept that nothing could be done to help chain dogs as long as they had food, water, and shelter. Food, water, and shelter just simply are not enough. Our groups, our group's primary focus has always been on the dogs. Even if it meant that we had to engage in situations of conflict that were often less than favorable, we didn't and wouldn't back down. Button pushing became our specialty when it came to applying the right amount of pressure on government and enforcement agencies. Not that we wanted to push people's buttons, but it seemed to be the only way to get real results. Asking direct questions to government, engaging the media, and rallying voices together is what helped our cause be successful. Thankfully, um, the days of button pushing are or, are or may be over in Nova Scotia, but there's still a lot of work ahead. Slowly, Nova Scotia is turning in a new direction that will see the end of legal 24-7 chaining of man's best friend, the first province in Canada to regulate tethering on a time limit basis. It is a start. It can be mentally and emotionally exhausting to run a campaign of this nature, not to mention the amount of time and dedication that's required to be successful. Through good times and bad, the three of us have always supported each other, allowing one another to vent out our frustrations 
and providing each other with emotional support. We had to keep our little team of three mentally healthy in order to continue on. We are three very different people living totally different lives and sometimes we have very different views. So we focused on our similarities, our concern about the welfare of animals instead of our differences and it worked very well. We also had one thing in common. We are all dedicated and stubborn. The perfect recipe for a successful campaign. Witnessing animal cruelty cases on a regular basis and not being able to do anything is painful. And it certainly isn't for everybody. However, everybody has the ability to have their voice heard. Exercise that right and exercise it often. It is the people of New Brunswick that can make this change happen. Speak out. Speak out and speak up. Eventually, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. The hard work and dedication of New Brunswickans is already starting to show results. It is now quite obvious that you have got the government's attention. Our message to advocates here today is to never give up and stay focused knowing that you will succeed. You will face good times and bad times. Celebrate the good and learn from the bad. Advocacy doesn't come without a cost. It really can take a toll on a person. Reach out to each other, support one another, and always listen to and respect each other's views. There's a Gandhi quote that says, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. There couldn't be any more truth to that quote. There couldn't be any more truth to that quote when looking at our experience generating change in Nova Scotia. We have been laughed at, we have been bullied, we have been harassed, we have been ignored, and told that we would never be successful. I guess those people had no idea who they were dealing with. <laughs> Standing here today are some very strong advocates who have taken on what is likely one of the biggest challenges in their life. I know many of these advocates personally, and they have and continue to pour every ounce of their energy into this campaign. They have and will likely face many obstacles. Support them, even if it means just lending an ear or a shoulder to cry on. They are dedicated, they are determined, and they are on the right path for success. Chain dogs will continue to suffer as long as you, the people, allow it. Even if you don't like or understand politics, please take the time to write your local MLA and demand tougher legislation to better protect animals. Only the government can change the law, and you must motivate them to do so. At the end of every leash in New Brunswick, there is a voter and you will be heard. And I just have one last thing I want to say is, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Next up is Joan Sinden. She's a remarkable animal advocate, and she's made it a mission to help dogs that suffer neglect and they don't know life off of a chain. Joan started her work when people for dogs saw the need for dogs to be rescued in addition to being advocated for. In her mission to date, she has freed 35 dogs, 32 of them from chains. Those same dogs are now adopted out to wonderful families. So we'd like to introduce you to Joan Sinden from Halifax, founder of No Chains, All Love, Nova Scotia.
for the Facebook page. Um, so uh, when I was thinking about what I could talk about today, I looked back at old blog posts that I've written on a blog that I've got going back to 2003, and it occurred to me that what you guys here in New Brunswick should, it occurred to me that you guys here in New Brunswick should be proud of yourselves. When push comes to shove, you step up. Back in 2004, your province was faced with the prospect of province-wide breed-specific legislation. Maybe a lot of you remember that time. There were hearings held around the province, and guess what? You all won. You do not have BSL in your province today. In 2009, a kennel by the name of Chapman killed 175 dogs, and no one noticed. Also in 2009, a man by the name of Keith Barton bludgeoned his Pomeranians to death with a hammer. All but one, a beautiful little creature named Sugar Bear. Mr. Barton was found guilty of only one count of cruelty to animals. But the animal lovers of New Brunswick came together to form something called the Bark Campaign, which I can't help but think has led us to this rally today, to this huge group of animal-loving New Brunswickers who are committed to making the world better for animals who can't help themselves. In Nova Scotia, we are very close to having it in our laws that abandoning, abandoning a pet will be illegal when our new regulations come into effect. That is hopefully going to happen in the fall. It will be illegal to abandon an animal in Nova Scotia. Here in New Brunswick, your animal advocates do not walk away from it. Your animal advocates do not walk away from animals in distress, and that is something to be very proud of. You have many people here who are stepping up today and have been for a long time for all animals, and it has gotten us to this rally today, so that today lots of people are listening and caring and wanting to make changes to the laws you're currently living with, so that the people who have the real power won't be allowed to walk away from animals in distress and basically abandoning that animal wherever it is. The reason I'm here today is because of the anti-tethering movement, how it's been brought to the forefront in the last year, and the great strides we've made bringing it to people's attention and to the legislators' attention too. I run a rescue called No Chains All Love that since last July has taken in 35 dogs, 32 of which were permanently chained. Some to dog houses, some to just trees with no shelter at all. But when all of them were unchained, something magically happened. They became normal dogs. They didn't become perfect dogs. You only have to look at your own dogs to know that a perfect dog does not exist. <laughs> but these chained dogs, whose statistics say are 2.8 times more likely to bite and are in the news from mauling children, have all just become normal pets when the chain is taken away. It's a fact. We are proving that one dog at a time in Nova Scotia with no chains all love. Tethered dogs deserve the same love and attention as any other dog, and it's time that they get some attention under the law as well. Tethering dogs gets to the core of cruelty to animals. Dogs cannot escape from where they're at, and they're at the mercy of everything. Their owners, their environment, the weather, other passing loose dogs, wildlife, everything. That's why it's so heinous and why it needs to be stopped. And it's so simple to do. Just bring the dog inside, and if you as a dog owner cannot do it, let the dog go. What most moved the anti-tethering movement along in Nova Scotia was the people of Nova Scotia. The time had come and people were sick and tired of seeing the same dogs in their neighborhood being neglected day after day, year after year, and they started calling the SBCA over and over and over, and it's produced results. Those dogs are now gone. The SBCA, in fact, has seized hundreds and hundreds of dogs in the last nine months because people have started to believe in their own power. When they see nothing happen, they call again and again until something is done and it's working. The, ag the agenda at the Nova Scotia SPCA has changed. They do seize chained dogs now who live in poor conditions, even if they have food and water and shelter. They will seize a dying dog, even if he has food, water, and shelter, and that's a paradigm shift. And it only happened because the people of Nova Scotia demanded it, and that's a fabulous thing. People do have power. It wouldn't have happened, though, 
if we would have continued to allow the status quo, if we would have allowed dogs to have continued dying at the end of their chains. Hopefully no more will, but I'd imagine we haven't seen the last of it, unfortunately. I hope not too many more have to die before we get our laws and the enforcers of our laws doing things the right ways. Here in New Brunswick, you too have enough um, of pet owners who are not willing to give the basics of animal care, and that makes sense to me. Because for as long as I've been watching the animal advocate community the last 10 years, your province has been stepping up when you've needed to, and I know you will continue to do it until the job is done, and the rest of Canada can only step back and watch. Your time has come, and the government of New Brunswick should get its legislation in line with what its constituents' beliefs are, and let them hear your voice. Let them hear what your voices are and make them listen. Thank you. Thank you, John. And our last speaker would have been Nicole Thibault of Kent County Animal Rescue. I think many of you are familiar with Nicole. So Nicole isn't able to attend today. So instead we have Susan Henley of Fredericton and she's gonna read a statement from Nicole. So thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Henley and I'm very proud to be able to speak on behalf of Nicole Thibault, who's unable to be here today because I'm sure she's out rescuing yet another helpless animal in need someplace in her area. So from Nicole, hi and welcome to the rally. I would like to apologize for not being able to be here in person, but believe me when I say KCAR, that's Kent County Animal Rescue, and myself are here in spirit and that we support Rita and the rest of the group fighting to have laws changed 1000%. I spoke a few years ago at a rally in Moncton and one of my first statements was, I'm not here to explain the law or go into detail about what needs to be changed. Sadly, my point then and my point now, years later, is the same. What we have as laws in New Brunswick just doesn't work. These laws are outdated and it's time to change them. The waiting is over. It's time for action. Haven't these animals suffered long enough? What I'm about to tell you is going to be hard to hear and may shock some of you, but it's very real. I know because I lived it and have seen the abuse with my own eyes and it happens more than we will ever know. Everyone here must have had one of those moments in life or one drastic event that has changed everything for them, that, change, that changes their way of thinking or acting forever. I'm here to tell you my story and maybe, just maybe, it will awaken everyone like it did me on that day. Two years ago after I started doing rescues, I got a call out on one. I was told about a dog living on a three to four foot chain. This dog was an elderly dog an approximately 11-year-old female chow. When the call came in, I had just started a new job and was quite busy with work and other things. The lady on the phone explained to me her concerns about this dog, that it was tied outside 24-7, that the chain was short, that the dog house was a barrel, and that she didn't even think that the dog could get in it, but also that the dog had some lumps on her belly and that the owners were refusing to take her to a vet. I suggested to her, as I always have, to call the authorities. I told her they would go get the dog and they might possibly press charges on the owners for neglect and told her to keep me posted. Five days later, I received another call from the same woman. She explained that she had called but that nothing had been done. I explained to her how busy they were and to give them some time. Another three days passed and she again called and said they had just gone but they had left the dog there and told her it was under investigation, which usually meant they had given the owners a warning. On the 10th day after she had first called me, on my way back from work with my sister, I decided to go and check this dog out to see if the authorities or someone had done anything about her. So I pulled into the yard. I went to the door, knocked, but nobody answered. I could hear the sound of a TV and someone walking around, but no one came to the door. And as I was about to leave, I spotted what looked like a dog lying down behind a garage. 
I walked over and what I found still to this day brings me to tears. There she was, lying down, where I'm sure she had spent most of her life. As I got closer, I could see the lumps on her belly, and I thought for sure she was dead. My heart dropped into my stomach. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. With the owners just a few feet away from me inside their home, casually watching TV, we cut the chain, we found a small mattress, and we managed to get her into the truck. We tried to hurry, but sadly on our way to the vet, she died in my arms. My only solace is that she did not die alone. That day did it for me. That day was an experience I will never forget, and to this day something that I will always regret. For 10 days I waited for someone to do something because I was not aware that our laws supported being tied 24-7. I was not aware that the authorities did not have the ability to do what they needed to do because our laws are so outdated, so old, and so ridiculous that an animal has no more, it is no more than a possession, like a chair, like a couch, or like the TV those people casually watched that day while their dog lay dying in their yard. While I waited, she suffered. She was in so much pain, she could not stand up anymore. She was lying in her own feces, being eaten alive. I was beside myself with anger. I was mad at the owners. I was mad at the authorities. I was mad at myself. How could we all fail so miserably as human beings to let any animal suffer this way? when we know they feel pain, when we know they feel sadness, when we know they feel fear just as much as we do. From that moment on, things changed for me. I will no longer wait for the authorities or anyone for that matter. I will not let them suffer. I will not let them suffer anymore, and I will keep pushing until someday somebody sees what I see, feels what I feel, and changes what needs to be changed so animals like this will never have to suffer again. These laws need to change, and the time is now. Too many are waiting, dying, and suffering at the end of their chains. They deserve better, and we as humans owe them that much. After all, Aren't they supposed to be man's best friend? Many chain dogs spend their lives merely attached to a six foot or shorter chain of life. Under these conditions, dogs are forced to eat, drink, urinate, defecate, and sleep with no escape or companionship. They live through heat, freezing cold, rain, snow, and wind. Their home turns into a disgusting muddy mess, a filthy bowl, and an icy landscape is all they have. What shelter is provided is often completely inadequate, such as this. And one wonders, what, why have a dog in the first place? Now this brings me to one of my current rescues, Sparky. We are now five or six years later from the first story I told you about, and what has changed? Absolutely nothing, because just recently I got a call to rescue a small corgi dog, Mix. I'm sure many of you have already heard the story or read it in the media, so I won't go into too many details, but this dog's living conditions were completely unacceptable. Have you seen the pictures? Have you seen what he called home for nine years of his life? Would you allow your dog to live this way? This dog has feelings can feel pain, can feel lonely, and can feel fear. Put yourself in his place for one minute and imagine what it must have felt like to slowly be buried alive while you're hopelessly tied to a chain as he was. Now imagine that the people you love and you thought loved you are the ones who have allowed this to happen. And all you wanted, to, all you wanted was to be next to them, loved and warm. Well, Sparky, you are loved and warm now, aren't you? I have been told
told what I did was wrong by taking this dog. What some may not realize is that the authorities did go see Sparky, but reported that the dog was just fine. By the time they had arrived, and had, we had already given him food and water, and the shelter was now barely visible. So he had food, water, and shelter. Apparently, according to our laws and according to their mandate, they say they couldn't do anything. Again, he was abandoned, tied to a chain, a few pieces of wood for a shelter, and buried alive. The authorities say that is okay. Well, it's not okay, is it? No. And we demand more, don't we? Yes. The animals can't speak, but we all can. I and so many other people will just not let them suffer anymore. We want changes, and we want them now. This is your chance to be their voice and help set the standard for animal care. They have suffered long enough. I'm ashamed to be a human on some occasions, but not today. Today we stand here for them. We speak for them, and I'm proud to be part of this rally. Let's end this suffering, work together, and make the changes that are so desperately needed to treat them like the living, loving, breathing, feeling souls that they are. Thank you so much for being here today and showing your support. Nicole. Thank you, Susan. And we're going to close out this rally with a few final words from Rita. Now, we would like to thank you all for your participation, for your support, and for speaking out to finally provide help for the neglected, abused, and tethered dogs in our province. We have all worked very hard should the government introduce a law which is mainly accommodating the public and the New Brunswick SPCA, but not the animals in a, matter, in a manner to provide protection. With your, with your help, our fight will continue. We are standing together and we will not give up. In closing, we thank you all once again for supporting our cause and for speaking out only together, we all can make a difference. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming today. And just remember, if you want that CD uh, from Kim Nowlin, you can uh, purchase a CD over here. And half of the proceeds go to uh, New Brunswick Rescue Dogs and the other half to Rescue Dogs in Nova Scotia. Good to see you all. Never told, tethered.